So my name is uh, Mike So I'm an obstetrician actually from King's in London, um, but I also have um, a role in fetal medicine. Uh, King's, as some of you may know, is a tertiary referral unit for fetal medicine. So although, as the last speaker said, it's a rare disease, uh, HFDN, it's not, it's not rare for me. Um, we probably see, I would have thought, about one case a month where we need to perform an intrauterine blood transfusion, not always for rhesus disease uh, or for hemolytic disease, but for other causes too. Um, I was just thinking to myself as we were sitting there and we were talking about don't worry about the men, the way things are moving in fertility, I suspect men will be having babies soon too. <laughs> so maybe we should uh, think about that. Okay, so anyhow, uh, back to 2017. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, give you a bit of a, um, a run through how we manage um, women who have red cell antibodies in pregnancy, specifically in relation to the concern about fetal uh, anemia. So when we talk about the principles of management, the things that we need to focus on uh, in, in our neck of the woods are how to determine if the fetus in this particular pregnancy is at risk of fetal anemia. Um, and then we need to predict um, if that fetus is at risk, when it is likely to be severely affected. Uh, if we do identify a fetus that is likely to be severely affected, obviously we need to test that baby uh, and then pre perform an intrauterine blood transfusion. And then to deliver the fetus at the optimum gestation, and it's always a balance really between the risks of the procedure of, of ongoing transfusions versus the risks of delivering um, preterm. So I'm just going to go through those sort of four points really one by one. You've already had a fantastic history lesson from our previous speaker, so I won't uh, go into that again, but just to point out that Professor Nicolaides, for those that you may or may not know him, uh, he's the, the boss at the fetal medicine unit I work at, he always starts his lecture by saying that fetal hydrops was first discovered by his grandfather, Hippocrates, <laughs> in 400 BC, and then proceeds to tell you the rest of the story. But you've heard all that already, so I won't go into that now. So again, we've also had a bit of a recap on the um, sort of physiology side of things. So as um, uh, our previous speaker explained, then the sensitizing events can happen in one of two ways, either from a blood transfusion given to the mother for some other reason, or because of a, um, exposure to fetal antigens which are foreign to her, and they can occur through a number of different sensitizing events. It can occur just spontaneously for no apparent reason, but it can also occur during events such as an amniocentesis or a CVS done early in pregnancy for maybe genetic testing. It occurs at delivery, it can occur uh, following trauma, miscarriage or termination. So many events that can occur during pregnancy which may result in a sensitizing event, particularly for anti-D, obviously, for D if we don't uh, provide anti-D during those situations that can lead to development of antibodies for the mother. Um, it doesn't normally uh, cause a problem in the first pregnancy and we think that's because the, the subclass of antibody that's produced is IgM, it's just a large antibody and it can't cross the placenta um, but eventually those antibodies become of the IgG subclass and so it's more common for it to occur in a second or subsequent pregnancy. The problem is that those antibodies across the placenta attach to the fetal red cells and then start destroying those red cells, causing hemolysis, eventually fetal anemia, and ultimately high drops and fetal death. So that's the mechanism by which it occurs. And although there have been more than 100 red cell antigens identified, uh, less than half of those have the ability to cause some form of isoimmunization. And as we've heard already, the most common ones um, still remain to be anti-D, little c, big E, which often occur in combination, um, and anti-Cal. And the non rhesus antigens um, probably less, account for less than 2% of, of antibodies that cause an issue with isoimmunization. So D and C are the most common. Uh, Kel uh, is becoming an increasing problem, I'm sure, as a result of uh, as a case that you described. Um, it's a particularly aggressive antibody because it affects not just only um, red cell hemolysis, but it also has an effect on progenitor uh, red cell precursors because they express the Kel antigen. And so they cause, essentially, um, bone marrow suppression. So the disease that we see with Kel tends to be more aggressive and also starts earlier in pregnancy. 
We may see it from the point of view that we referred a woman with significant antibody teeters, but we also see it in cases sometimes where we find a fetus that's found to be anemic. Um, it's always important for us to think about other causes, so not to get too distracted always by red cell antibodies, but infection for us is quite a common cause, in particular uh, parvovirus infection, which is, um, you probably know, it's a slap cheek syndrome, very common in young children, and therefore women uh, easily, with young children easily exposed to it. Cytomegalovirus, also another um, cause of of uh, anemia, which we don't see too infrequently, fetal maternal hemorrhage, and twin to twin transfusion. I don't know whether that case that you were talking about earlier was twin to twin transfusion when you were talking about the first one, that was something different. But twin to twin transfusion is a condition where if you have identical twins in the same sac, sharing a uh, in a separate sac, sharing a placenta, you can get hemorrhage from one baby to the other. It's a classic. You get one baby that's very pale and one baby that's very um, bright red because it's got too much blood. So all of these can lead to that uh, picture. Okay, so it's a busy slide, but I'm just going to talk you through it because these are basically the principles of how we manage um, a woman when she pitches up in the fetal medicine unit um, with a clinically significant red cell antibody. Um, so the first thing that you need to ask, or the first thing we ask when we uh, are referred a patient is, is there any history? Is there any history in previous pregnancies of either fetal anemia or neonatal um, problems. So you need to delve quite hard sometimes because I think um, one of somebody in the audience was talking about that baby that came back. Sometimes it may be a neonatal thing. They may have neonatal top-up transfusions, they have exchange transfusions. So you need to basically get a good history from the woman as to whether there's been any problems that are like that in her previous pregnancies. So if she hasn't had a, a previous event or it's her first pregnancy, then um, in general, the management would be to just keep an eye on the teeters. So, I mean, there are different, as you said, you've got advice from the, from the uh, laboratories when they send their uh, results back. But in, an, in essence, it's to repeat the blood teeters uh, or the concentrations uh, once a month up until 28 weeks and then every two weeks there on after. And to a large extent, if, if, if we talk about rhesus D here, if the, uh, teacher, if the concentration remains below four international units, then the chances of a, of a fetus developing anemia in that scenario is virtually zero, um, if there is no history. Uh, similarly with anti-C, less than 7.5 international units, similarly at, at, at very low risk. And with most other antibodies, we use a cutoff of one in 32. I know it's confusing, some are in teeters and some are in international units. But essentially, in those pregnancies, um, we do, however, still generally recommend delivery by about 38 weeks. I put in this in a, a little arrow going at the top to consider paternal uh, testing. And I don't know how often that happens routinely, because obviously if you knew the father wasn't carrying an antigen that would put the fetus at risk of, uh, and the mother therefore to develop antibodies, you could argue that this, that doesn't need to be done. But I think there are always some concerns about paternity. So in uh, London, I think uh, studies have shown that there's about a 10% non-paternity rate. So I think that's probably why, in general, we still carry on doing teeter testing or um, for pregnant women. Um, and the reason we usually advise delivery by 38 weeks is because of the fact that there's always a bit of a lag time, isn't there, between when you take your blood and when you get your results. So, and also boosting of antibody levels is more common in the third trimester. So in general, if you've got a, an antibody which can cause a problem, then we generally uh, offer induction around 38 weeks of pregnancy. Um, slightly different if you're dealing with Kel, because I said earlier, Kel is a very aggressive antibody. And although there have been few cases reported if the teeters are less than 1 in 32, nevertheless, there has been the odd case. And certainly our strategy is if we're referred a patient with Kel antibodies, even if the levels are lower than 1 in 32, we do tend to keep a closer eye on them. Um, if you've got an obstetric history of uh, disease, of previous disease in a pregnancy, then the teeters are not helpful. So it doesn't really, uh, it's not useful for us at all because the severity or onset of the disease, disease is generally not correlated with the TETA levels. So if they've got a previous history, you need to refer directly for, um, to a fetal medicine unit for further uh, monitoring. So as I said, the reasons to refer to fetal medicine would be because of a history or if your antibody levels during your routine testing do rise above the threshold. So for uh, rhesus D, if it's between 4 and 15, there's, about a mo there's a moderate risk that the fetus could become anemic and above 15, a pretty high risk. Similarly with anti-C, between 7.5 and, and 20 would give you a moderate risk and above 20, a high risk. And as I said, Kel, we, we take it as a high risk antibody anyway. <coughs> 
So once you refer them to fetal medicine, the first thing we think about is the paternal antigen uh, status, although I do add that caveat about paternity, um, and you might need to ask your patient in a separate room <laughs> whether there could be any reason why uh, we shouldn't take blood from the, the, the man that is accompanying her to the visit. Um, but essentially, if the father, and I have done it a couple of times, um, if the father is negative, um, or it may be a different partner um, from previous pregnancy, then we would suggest normal care, okay, because obviously that fetus is not going to be at risk. If, on the other hand, um, the father is positive for the antigen, the culprit antigen, then the next step would be to uh, do zygosity testing and uh, with a view to potentially performing fetal antigen typing during pregnancy, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Now, this is something when I was at medical school that I could never remember. So um, I know we've already had a back to basics lessons, but this is just a quick diagram, partly for my own uh, benefit, but also for those of you who might have forgotten about this. So in, whether the father is heterozygous depends, or homozygous for that particular antigen, depends on a number of factors. It's affected by which antibody we're talking about. So in, in D, for example, um, I'm sure a lot of you know this already, um, about 50% of the, of the Caucasian population at least would be heterozygous for D. Um, but that's not true in an African population, for example, where, as I understand it, less than 1% would be heterozygous. Um, similarly, with Cal, most people are negative, whereas, again, in D, it's a, it's a lesser number. So, it, depending on what we, antibody we're talking about will depend on, you know, what the chances of that father being heterozygous are. So, obviously, if the father's homozygous, the baby is going to carry the, the culprit antigen. But if it's heterozygous, there'll be a 50-50 chance, and that's why I drew that little diagram. So, if we're talking about D, if you look at how you can inherit which of the two alleles from a parent, you can see that, essentially, the fetus could be 50% chance of being, essentially, rhesus positive and 50% chance of being rhesus negative. And in that situation, fetal genotyping is extremely useful for us because it means that we can then work out whether the pregnancy is genuinely at risk or not and we can then uh, app appropriately monitor in terms of the frequency of monitoring because it becomes very intense once you've worked you've decided that the woman is at high risk so how do we determine fetal antigen status again I think you touched on this briefly before we always uh, previously had to do it by doing an invasive test so a chorionic villus sample or an amniocentesis where we then use PCR, or we didn't, somebody did, uh, to use PCR to look for fetal DNA. Um, the problem with that was obviously these tests carry a risk of miscarriage in pregnancy of about one in a hundred. Um, and they also um, boost the antibody level, so a double whammy really, not great. Um, fortunately now, um, clever people have developed this testing cell for free, uh, cell free DNA where you can take a blood sample from the mother and you can actually find fetal DNA and look for these particular antigens. Um, in the, uh, not the antigens, look for the, do the genotyping in the fetus. Um, brilliant because it's non-invasive and therefore it's not associated with any risks other than a small puncture to your arm. Um, we can, we, they can look for D, KEL, little c and little e, so the ones that are the main problem. Um, it can be detected from as early as seven weeks it's reported, but it generally isn't uh, done routinely until about, well, we tend to do it after 20 weeks just because it reduces the false negative rate. So if you do, take a sample, sometimes you don't get a result early or you have a higher risk of getting a false negative. And obviously that's what we're worried about. We don't want to tell somebody there's no risk, send them away and do less monitoring if they are actually at high risk. Um, and the false positive rate after 16 weeks is said to be less than 1%. But it's not 100%, and that's a slight problem. So although we can be very reassuring that the baby is not likely to be at risk, we don't actually, in reality, or we don't, I don't know about other fetal medicine news, we don't completely say it's absolutely fine, go away, have a nice pregnancy and never see them again. We just reduce quite significantly the frequency of monitoring because it's very unlikely that there'll be a problem. Okay, so if we've now worked out that we think this fetus is at risk, how do we then manage them? So we basically use a method called the um, a method of ultrasound, which is monitoring the middle cerebral artery in the fetus. Sounds very clever, um, but it isn't really. Um, and we obviously monitor the fetus using ultrasound for signs of high drops. So I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. And we start that, obviously, either at the point at which, the, which we identify there's a high risk, but in women with a previous history of um, HDFN, um, a lot of studies have shown that the, uh, the timing of the onset of the next problem in the next pregnancy is approximately 10 weeks before the onset of problems in the previous pregnancy. So if you started doing transfusions at 30 weeks in the previous pregnancy, we start monitoring from about 20 weeks in a subsequent pregnancy.
And basically, when we look at the, it's looking at the velocity of flow in the blood in the fetal brain, if you like, and I'm going to show you some nice pictures of that in a minute. And we, it's a very simple test that we can do, and all we have to do is plot the velocity on a graph, and if it's more than one and a half standard deviations above the mean for gestation, then there's a high risk that the baby could be anemic, and then we would consider doing a cordocentesis where we put a needle into the um, fetal cord and take a blood sample to measure the hemoglobin. Signs of high drops would be very suggestive of fetal anemia, and that would also be an indication to do a cordocentesis. If the uh, MCA re remains uh, below uh, 1.5 SDs, we can be reassured, and we just manage the patient expectantly by continuing to follow them up, though, every week. Um, so, as I said, it's quite labor-intensive, and particularly as we're a tertiary unit, it means we're taking referrals from all around uh, southeast England and sometimes further afield, which means they're coming to us about once a week, because there are not lots and lots of people doing this kind of monitoring around the country, other than in fetal medicine units. Again, in terms of timing of delivery, if you've got significant antibodies of significant levels to require this degree of monitoring, we would advise induction at 36 weeks because for two reasons. One, because, again, this lag time in getting results, but also because the MCA PSV, which is what we use, becomes less reliable after 35 weeks in terms of predicting anemia. So it's not a good test beyond that gestation. So it's safer to advise delivery at 36 weeks. And in terms of fetal outcome at 36 weeks, it's the same as term to a large extent. So there's no benefit really to continue uh, being pregnant in that situation. So um, these are two ultrasound images of fetal uh, high drops. Now, how do I make this? Yep, it's working. Uh, so basically, this is a, on the right-hand side of the fetal heart, and you can see that there's uh, black fluid. Point around it now. You see this black fluid around the outside edge of the heart, it's a pericardial effusion, which is quite a common feature of um, significant fetal anemia. And on the left-hand side, it's a sagittal section. If I was lying on the bed like that, through the fetal chest and abdomen, so the chest is at the top. And then you see that big black sort of balloon, that's ascites, so it's fluid in the fetal abdomen. That little thing floating around the middle is the fetal liver. And that little round circle looking at you is also the fetal stomach. So it's a very easy diagnosis to make on ultrasounds, very obvious. And that is a fairly typical presentation for severe fetal anemia. And babies that have this kind of picture on ultrasound scan tend to have hemoglobins down in this range. Okay, so how do we uh, measure the mid-cerebral artery peak systolic velocity, which, as I said, sounds very clever, but isn't particularly. Um, if you can scan, you'll recognize that this is a, a cross -se an axial section through the fetal skull. Um, and then, basically, if you put the color flow Doppler on, you will identify something called the circle of Willis, back to anatomy lessons for those of you who ever did them. Um, and the circle of Willis, basically, from the circle of Willis, the uh, vessel that you can see running directly upwards, conveniently, is the um, middle cerebral artery in the fetal brain. And if you put a, power, a pulse wave Doppler on that, which is like a little caliper, and you measure it, you get a reading, which tells you that it is X meters per second, and you put that into your uh, program, and there will be a graph that looks a little bit like the one on the right, where you can tell what your value is in relation to what it should be for that gestational age. So if you look at the graph on the right, the thick blue line running up is the mean, so the average that you would expect to see in a fetus of that gestation. Um, and the lines going above are obviously getting higher and higher above what you'd expect. And the red dots show you babies that were very significantly anemic. So you can see that it's actually a pretty good test in terms of predicting fetal anemia. And this is, was described as early as 1986 by Kipros Nicolaides group. Um, then the unit was run by Stuart Campbell. And then, in fact, in uh, yeah, about 2000 now, so 17 years ago, a guy called Mari um, actually wrote it up in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that's really when it became a fairly common practice to start using this as a method of screening. The theory behind it is that you become anemic, your blood becomes less viscous, and your cardiac output starts, your venous return increases, and your cardiac output starts speeding up. So it basically increases the velocity of the flow within the blood. Um, and we know that it's an extremely good test because it has... 100% sensitivity at that cutoff. So if you use one and a half standard deviations, you will not miss anybody. That's basically the theory. 
So, and that has been borne out in practice, and certainly it's, I've, that's been borne out in my own practice. So it's an extremely good test because you won't miss anybody. The only downside of any test like this, because it's a screening test, it's not, it's not a diagnostic test, it's not telling me definitely the baby has anemia, is it has a false positive rate of 12%. So that means 12% of the time you will say the baby is anemic, or you will think the baby is anemic, and you will do a, a cordon synthesis, but you will find the, the haemoglobin to be normal. Yeah. So that's always a trade-off with any screening test of any sort, that there will always be a false positive rate, but it's an extremely uh, sensitive test. One of the pitfalls with it, is it perfect? Well, it's not completely perfect, obviously for the reason I just said, that you, don't, uh, you often over-diagnose anemia, if you like, by a small amount. It doesn't really change in mild anemia, but then you, you'd say, well, it doesn't matter because you're not going to be transfusing when it's only mild, but you just keep an eye on it. Um, it doesn't work very well after 35 weeks, as I said, and that's why we have this policy of induction at 35 to 36 weeks in women with significant antibody levels. And it becomes much less accurate after you've given one transfusion. So the minute you've, you give a blood transfusion, obviously that's not always the end of it in that pregnancy. You may need to give another one. And it becomes less good in the sense that you're more likely to think the baby is anemic when it isn't. So when we've given one transfusion, what we actually do is we increase our threshold. So instead of saying 1.5 um, standard deviations, we use two standard deviations to try and reduce the number of people that we over-diagnose fetal anemia for so that we only then transfuse those uh, that need, I'll do another course in teeth and those that really need it. Um, it's, technically, there are some issues, for those of you who scan, you may know this, but it's, it's one of those things, like many things, where you've got, it's just an ultrasound parameter, it's got to be done properly. If it's not done properly, you're not going to, it's not going to be a useful test. So it has to be measured very close to the origin. Um, it can't be measured when the baby's very active, because it tends to go up when the baby's active, and it's often affected by other things like accelerations and uterine contractions. So you just need to be quite careful when you do your testing, and that's why it's probably not a widespread thing just done in every hospital. It is does tend to be done just either by fetal medicine trained people or by in tertiary units. This was the old days um, before we had um, uh, this test. We were doing amniocentesis and we were looking to see how um, much bilirubin was in the amniotic fluid because a breakdown product of hemolysis is bilirubin, as you know, and that passes into the amniotic fluid. So the only way we could assess that in those days was to do an amnio and take fluid, and they did spectroscopy and worked out that basically um, through serial spectroscopy is where the baby was becoming more anemic, and that was their test. So it was multiple amniocentesis. So you can imagine that finding a simple ultrasound marker was a major revolution in terms of monitoring uh, these pregnancies. Again, in the... So, uh, again, in the, in the early days, the first transfusions were actually done uh, intraperitoneally, so into the baby's abdomen, but you can see that the downside of that was the um, uh, side effect of intrauterine fetal death, which was very high, particularly at early gestations, um, and still pretty significant at term. So that was what we were doing initially, but in 1982, again, this is Charles Rodek and Kipros Nicolaides, that's actually them in the picture on the left, you probably wouldn't recognise him now, so he looks a little bit less hair and a little bit less beard, but um, they started doing a percutaneous um, through the maternal abdomen into the fetus directly um, and into the cord or into the uh, liver vessels, um, putting uh, blood directly into the fetus that way. And this became, um, again, more common practice from about 1986. So I've got a couple of little video clips for you. So this is, um, you can see on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the needle coming into the abdomen. Whoops, my marker's poking around. So you see that there, that's a needle coming through the, the uterus and going directly through the fetal chest and into the left ventricle of the fetus. Um, and we use this primarily when the fetus is very uh, young, so usually less than 20 weeks, because the cord is so tiny at that point, it's usually one or two millimeters in diameter of the vessels, so it's very hard to get um, a needle into that when they're very small, if you need to do a very early transfusion. And sometimes, I did one uh, more recently, who, who was actually 30 weeks um, into the heart because of the position of the baby and the position of the placenta. So obviously, we don't really want to go through the placenta because it will boost the antibody levels and the baby was in a, um, the cord was in a difficult position, so we went into the heart. And it's, it's a perfectly feasible thing to do. There are some downsides, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, this is basically what we tend to do more often, which is, again, you can see the needle coming in here on the right-hand side. My cursor keeps disappearing. Where's it gone? 
There we go. So coming in through here, this is the umbilical cord, it's the placenta there. So we're actually coming into the placental cord insertion and going into the vein and you can see the blood actually being injected there. You see that going up and going into the cord. Um, obviously the problem with that is it's still an invasive procedure and the overall fetal loss rate is probably about 1-2% to 2%, um, overall across gestations. But you can see that's a marked difference from how when we were doing intraperitoneal transfusion. So that's kind of a, a great, again, improvement over the years in uh, management of these pregnancies. Okay, so as I mentioned, you can go into... Um, cardiac or intraperitoneal even, um, and we tend to reserve that for less than 20 weeks. The main problem with um, that is that when you go into the heart, when you come out, often you get a bit of bleeding, it can lead to cardiac tamponade, and that can be quite difficult to deal with. So it really is reserved for the cases where we really have no other option, and more often than not, we would choose to go directly into the umbilical cord, um, either through the placenta, if the placenta is anterior, which has the advantage of the fact that the cord is nice and stable. So when you come in through the placenta, obviously that cord insertion is not moving. It's very straightforward to get in. If you're going from the other way around, which I showed you in the video, it's more mobile, the cord insertion, as you come through the amniotic fluid, and that can be a bit more tricky. So there are ups and downs, depending on um, which way you do it. So we use an 18 to 20 gauge needle, and we do it always under direct uh, ultrasound guidance. Um, we aspirate a mill of blood first, and that gets tested in a HemoQ machine, which is right next to you, so you get an immediate result. And then we work out the transfusion volume, and that's based on a number of factors, which obviously include what the pre-transfusion hematocrit in the baby is, and then the estimated vetoplacental blood volume, which changes with gestation. So it's a combination of that plus the hematocrit of the donor blood. So we take all those things into account, and actually, uh, again, this was, uh, I think, designed by Kipros Nicolaides. We have quite a clever program that works out how much blood that we should give. In general, it's about 10 mils per week of gestation above 20 weeks. So if you're 22 weeks, in general, we give 20 mils, and 23 weeks, 30 mils, and so on and so forth. But it means by the time you get to the third trimester, 30, 32 weeks, if you're doing your kind of last couple of transfusions, you could be injecting, you know, 80, 90 mils of blood which doesn't sound like very much to us, but going through a syringe in a tense moment where you're holding a needle in the cord, I can tell you that can be a little bit taxing at times. And the blood is donor blood, it's O rhesus negative and it's cross-matched to maternal blood, irradiated and washed, so it's white cell depleted to try and reduce the risk of graft versus host disease, and obviously it's packed so that, um, to a hematocrit of about 80% to obviously reduce the amount of volume that we need to transfuse. A small baby can't take a big amount of blood, it will just collapse, so um, the more concentrated the blood, the better from that perspective. The next transfusion usually occurs about a week later, um, sometimes up to two. It's quite variable, but it does depend um, on the gestation and how bad the hemoglobin was in the first place. Um, and the hemoglobin after transfusion tends to drop about 1% per day. So we, again, we try to work out, given what we've given and how much the blood count was to start with, how, far, how high we've managed to raise it, because we take a blood sample at the very end, send that to, for, to the lab and get a, a proper um, HB from the lab, and then we can work out how often do we think we need to transfuse Views. But if you're thinking that, you know, if we're starting at sometimes at 20 weeks, we might do one a week or two later, and then it's every two to three weeks from then. So in, in a very um, high-risk pregnancy that's had, um, uh, starting very early in pregnancy, again, this can be quite a problem because they're coming back frequently for quite a relatively high-risk procedure. The more blood that's replaced um, in the baby with donor blood, obviously, the less uh, quickly we need to replenish it because it's not getting eaten up by the antibodies. So they do tend to spread out the more you do, but there's very rarely do you, are you ever able to stop once you start it. You have to keep going until the end of pregnancy. And then it's really, as I said, a case of deciding when is the right time to deliver. So I would say it's usually between 32 and 35 weeks, depending on whether you're going to do another transfusion at 32. I don't like doing it at 32 because obviously the baby's viable, it's got a very good chance of survival, and there's always that 1% chance you could cause a big problem by doing a transfusion. So sometimes we opt for delivery at 32. If it's a very easy uh, transfusion with a nice straightforward cord insertion, we may give one last one at 32 weeks and then aim to deliver at 35 weeks, particularly in a woman who's had lots of you know, normal deliveries before who just wants to be induced, because often at 32 weeks can be very difficult to get the person, a woman into labour and you may end up doing a caesarean. So it's a big balance between all of those different factors. <clears throat> 
So are we saving any lives by doing all of this? Because it sounds all pretty dangerous, doesn't it, really? Um, and yes, we are. We're kind of, we're doing pretty well. Overall survival is about 90%. You have to remember a lot of these fetuses can be quite sick when they come to us. Um, and there was a large study called the Lotus Study, which looked at um, long-term outcomes in fetuses that had undergone transfusion. They showed the developmental impairment in about 5%, which probably isn't hugely higher than the background risk. Obviously, there are other reasons why children have neurodevelopmental impairment. And they looked particularly at what sort of factors uh, seem to cause, the, uh, seem to have the highest risk of this partic these particular issues. And it looks like it's the babies with the most severe high drop. So in many ways, you know, our role is to stop that baby becoming hydropic and therefore monitoring, picking up these babies early, monitoring them appropriately using MCA and intervening with transfusions, albeit they may sound dangerous, it's got to be a good thing not to allow those babies to become hydropic and therefore have a much worse outcome in the long term. Okay, thank you. That's all I've got to tell you about the current management of uh, red cell antibodies in pregnancy.